What type of progesterone should you use for your frozen embryo transfer? Do you have to use that muscular progesterone? Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and fertility doctor. And today I wanna to talk about embryo transfers, the different types and the type of progesterone that you need to use. Now, this is a hot topic and this is something that has changed. Let's all remember the field of REI is still relatively young in medicine. IVF has been around around 40 years and things have changed dramatically. So an embryo transfer is the part in the process where we are taking an embryo and putting it inside your body. That actual act is relatively easy to be honest. It is like a pap smear. So a speculum goes in the vagina, a very small catheter is used and placed through the cervical os into the uterine cavity, and then an embryo is deposited near the top of the uterus. Now in that process, that's the same, right? No matter how you have a transfer or what protocol you use, that process is the same. But there are a lot of different protocols and medications you can use, and this can be very confusing. A lot of this confusion comes from when IVF first started, we didn't have wonderful technology to freeze and thaw embryos. That means we essentially did fresh transfers with your best embryo. A fresh transfer is putting the embryo inside in the same cycle where you got the eggs out. Let's remember how the body works because that's gonna help you understand IVF. In a normal month, you have a group of eggs that all come out of that vault inside the ovary. Brain sends out FSH or follicle stimulating hormone which stimulates one egg to grow. There's one egg inside each follicle. As that follicle grows, it makes estrogen which stimulates the lining of the uterus. When it gets mature, it then ovulates and that follicle reforms and becomes a corpus luteum and makes progesterone. That egg is in the fallopian tube, gets fertilized by sperm within the first 24 hours, and that embryo divides and grows over the course of the next five to six days till it arrives into the uterine cavity where it then implants. So when we do IVF now, we're growing embryos in the lab for those five to six days until they're called a blastocyst. When IVF first started though, we didn't have a way to get them to day five or six, so you only could get them to day three. Their metabolic needs change after day three, so they need different requirements and culture, and that was a huge development once we figured that out. But what happened is you would grow these embryos inside, and then you would put it in the body a few days later, mimicking day three of where it would be in the fallopian tube, and then the embryo just had to hang out inside the uterus. Well, we know flat on that 50% of embryos that fertilize tend to not even make it to that blastocyst stage. So pregnancy rates were very low and people were putting in lots of embryos and those embryos didn't survive the freeze thaw very well because we used older slow freezing technology. And so there just wasn't really great success. The day that you do the egg retrieval is essentially the day of ovulation or consider that day zero. The embryo is in day one, day two, day three. So you would put the embryo inside on day three if ovulation is day zero, the day of the egg retrieval. Well, once embryos started growing out into culture better, we had better rates because of selection. Some of the embryos that weren't going to make it didn't make it through the process. And then also we're timing it better with the uterus. So we're able to say, oh, this is around the stage an embryo would naturally come into the uterus, so I'm going to put it inside now. In the same timeline, freezing techniques got better, felt more comfortable putting one embryo inside and saving other embryos. And also genetic testing became much more reliable. So you see great survival rates from biopsying, freezing, thawing embryos, and you're getting the ability to determine what embryo has the highest potential. So that has really driven a lot more attention to frozen embryo transfers, which a lot of us do the majority of. One, because you can synchronize the uterus and the embryo better. If you don't have an embryo ready on day five, because some embryos are a little slow and they're not ready, they're not day five till day six, those are what day six embryos are, just took it until day six to get to the stage it should be at day five, but you're doing a fresh transfer, are you just putting it in prematurely and there's some dyssynchrony? Also in fresh cycles, you have very unnatural estrogen and progesterone levels, things that are much outside the normal realm. And now we know that those high levels is what contributes to some of the adverse outcomes that we have seen in IVF cycles over time, such as growth restriction and preterm birth and babies being born small and early and overall not doing well. And this is really because of 
what we think of as issues with the placenta, right? If that placenta is trying to grow in in an abnormal hormone environment that's really high, it might not attach in the way that we want it to, and that might lead to some of these further down the road complications. Now we know that in frozen embryo transfer cycles, we are seeing improvements because the hormone levels aren't nearly as high in some of these fetal outcomes. The classic controlled embryo cycle is not ovulating, not doing anything natural at all, and essentially overtaking the body. You may use birth control pills and or Lupron to suppress, then you grow the lining with estrogen, pills or patches or vaginal or injectable, check that it gets thick enough, and then you start progesterone. And progesterone can be oral, vaginal, or intramuscular, like a not a subcutaneous shot like the other IVF medications, but an actual big shot and it's thick, it's progesterone and oil, it's not the most fun. That's been the protocol that we've done for frozen embryo transfers for a substantial amount of time. Some advantages, it's well planned out, you know your calendar, you know when it's happening, you can schedule around things, you can really give somebody extended estrogen if they need that, you can add on Lupron if there might be some endometriosis or inflammation, or something else that you're trying to control. So there are some nice aspects. Also, if you no longer ovulate, you're out of eggs, and this is the protocol for you. Now, there has long been debate, even though we grow the lining with estrogen, but there's long been debate about the type of progesterone you use and if one is better than the other. In the same light, in the most recent years, we've seen a lot of attention given to modified natural cycles. And a modified natural or a natural cycle is where the body is growing the lining by an egg making estrogen as it's growing, just like that natural cycle. Brain sends out FSH, you get an egg to grow, that egg makes estrogen and grows the lining. The thought here is that the corpus luteum makes a lot of important things besides just progesterone, and some of those hormones might help improve ultimate outcomes. In this cycle, you can do it also a variety of ways. You can give medication to stimulate ovulation, like letrozole or injectable gonadotropins like FSH or LH. You can use a trigger shot or go off of your natural surge, and you can use no progesterone because you're ovulating, the corpus luteum is gonna make progesterone, or you can supplement with vaginal progesterone. And so these are the different options for what you can do in a modified natural or in a controlled cycle. There was a recent study because long debate is you have the camp of people saying that any progesterone matters or progesterone oil is better or a modified natural cycle is better. We know that modified natural cycles do really well. You have to be able to get somebody to ovulate. You have to have some flexibility in tracking the cycle and not everybody can have that cycle, although I really like it when it's in the options that a clinic has. But this study looked at thousands of transfers and was looking at what had the best outcomes as far as rate of success. So in this study, over 6,000 cycles were analyzed and in the modified natural cycle group, patients were followed to ovulate and they were given a trigger shot. So everybody was given an HCG trigger and they were given vaginal progesterone, either prenone or endometrin, so two different types, and their pregnancy rates were followed. So the frozen embryo transfer happened seven days after the HCG trigger, which is pretty standard. For the programmed or the controlled cycles, this is where we're replacing all the medications. People were given estrogen in pills or patches, some given Lupron, some not given Lupron. So overall, there's a couple different groups. And then they were given different types of progesterone. So one group was vaginal only. And in the vaginal only group, it was crinone or endometrin. There was an intramuscular progesterone group in which everybody got I and progesterone of 50. And then there was a combination group where people got intramuscular progesterone every three days with vaginal every day. And then the transfer happened about 120 hours after the start of the progesterone, essentially the same time in both groups. And then they looked at the outcome of what happened. And so essentially the rate of success among cycles that were modified natural, programmed with I am progesterone only, or programmed with I am progesterone every three days in vaginal was essentially non-different. So essentially the same. There was a significant decrease in success in patients who had controlled cycles that used only vaginal progesterone. So the vaginal progesterone alone was not sufficient and their live birth rates were markedly lower than the other groups. So to me, this study is telling us that 
we can use individual patient selection to determine if a modified natural or a controlled cycle is best for the patient. However, if you are not ovulating, you're not having a follicle that's making any progesterone, we need to be getting at least some intramuscular progesterone. It should be a red flag if your doctor is saying this is fine for pills or vaginal and you don't need any intramuscular if you're not ovulating. If you're doing a modified natural or you're doing a fresh cycle, meaning the corpus luteum is going to make some progesterone, we are supplementing. So vaginal is fine because your body is making some and we're just giving additional. In a controlled or a program cycle, your body is making none. We are replacing, we're giving everything. And in order to get high enough levels, there needs to be some intramuscular progesterone, whether it is every day or every third day with vaginal daily. Those are the two choices that are sufficient. So talk to your doctor about a controlled versus a modified natural. I have different patient populations on who I would choose what on as first line. Things in your history like prior conceptions, prior live births, do you ovulate, what your lining was, if you've had surgery on your uterus, if you have endometriosis, autoimmune diseases, high levels of inflammation, PCOS. So different patient characteristics make me lean toward a certain cycle type first, but that should be able to be individualized. But definitely we know if you're doing a programmed or a controlled cycle, if you're not making progesterone naturally, you need at least some intramuscular. All right, I will link the study in below and happy to answer questions as this is emerging research that just came out in fertility and sterility. As always, you can get some information on the As a Woman podcast and we have a YouTube channel you can check out if you're a YouTube person because you're here. You can also follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. Thanks, friends.